Good morning. Could I have you come closer, please? Dorothy, don't go far, because I want to introduce you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Nellis. I'm a member of the Santa Barbara County Genealogical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you to our third Picnic in the Cemetery event. If we were about 20 to 40 years younger, we would be picnicking here on blankets. But <laughs> since we do need to be seated at tables and chairs, our picnic will actually take place over at the San Inez Valley Museum in a couple of hours, and I think you will enjoy that. I would like to introduce my cohort in planning this, Dorothy Oxner, who's standing right here to my left. Somebody's lost their keys. Somebody has lost keys. Left them on the table. Left them on the table. It says Phillips. <laughs> Uh, let me explain a little bit about how this day works, and it's really fun and it's very easy. You all receive name tags, and on your name tags are a colored dot. So check that out. You will be visiting different parts of the cemetery today to meet some of the residents, and how we make the move uh, smoothly is that you will be escorted by a tour leader who has a colored that matches colored card that matches your dot on your tag. So if you tour leaders will hold them up, you'll see there's blue and red and pink and orange and so forth. So after the conclusion of the introduction, if you will just find your tour person and she will lead you to where you're going to start circulating through the cemetery. And it is kind of important to stay with a group. Uh, it just makes the flow a little bit easier. While you're listening to the resident stories, please be sure you stand close enough so that you can hear what he or she has to say. But remember, these people are dead. <laughs> so you can't talk to them. You cannot engage them. You cannot say hello to them. And when they're done, they will turn their backs or go back to sleep. So don't applaud because it wouldn't do any good. They cannot hear you. <laughs> The restrooms are over here on the edge of the building. The women's is right here, and the men's is behind it if you need to, to use them. We have provided water, so if you, before you start uh, on your tour today, if you want to grab, please take water out of the open one first, and then if all the waters are gone, we'll open up the second one. We have printed programs that will be coming shortly. Uh, they're, they're en route. And I also have been provided by Chris Bashforth, the director of the museum, directions to, to the museum for those of us who are unfamiliar. So we'll make sure that you get to your lunch. Uh, just realize that you will, when you've concluded the tour, that you will be get back in your cars and go over to the museum. And um, I, like I said, either see me or we will have the printed programs on the table before you leave, and that will that will give you the directions too. So plan to linger a little bit after lunch. Now before I introduce uh, one of our residents here, I would like to give you just a brief three sentences or so background about the cemetery. It is the oldest public cemetery in the San Inez Valley and you will learn today who donated the land for this cemetery to, to be preserved. The first recorded burial here was August 1st, 1883 when a Dr. Gillespie was interred here don't know the circumstances. He wasn't here very long before he died. Uh, the state of California declared it an official cemetery in 1886 and currently it encompasses almost 13 acres and there is a hope that they will be able to expand it. it it's filling up. And there have been only five cemetery di directors in 126 year history, which I find pretty remarkable. Only five men have held the job. And the current manager, manager is David Jacola, and he will probably join us later this morning. He just got back from vacation, so he will plan to be here. And I hope we've covered everything. They're not, they're not going to be mowing today, and they're not going to be watering, and no funerals. <laughs> so, taken care of. Uh, are there any questions? Alex, we'll learn about that. Any other questions? Okay, 
Let me introduce you to Ballard's founder, George W. Lewis. My name is George Whitlaw Lewis. I was born in 1829 in Lockport, New York, in Madison County. Lockport is on the southern edge of Oneida Lake. Oneida Lake is the largest lake completely within the state of New York. It's on the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal went through there. My parents, Henry and Parmela Lewis, were from New Jersey, and how they got to New York, I don't know. But they didn't stay there very long. They had what was happening in America at that time, the desire to go west, and they went west. When I was about 20 years old, I also got that desire and came west. I ended up here in this valley in about 1856, and I bought land, and it was called Elamato Pentado, and for you Yankees, that means painted cottonwood. The Chumash Indians used to have a tree on this property that they painted for ceremonial purposes, and uh, that's where its name came from. I also had uh, land dealings down in Sonoro, Mexico, and I traveled back and forth to there many times, and Sonoro was a pretty wild place at that time, and there was a lot of land speculating going on down there, and it was a great place to make money rapidly, and so that's why I was dealing down there. But it turned out that things got pretty bad, and I decided I had to go down there and wrap up my operations. And I figured it was going to take a couple of years for me to do that. So I talked to my good friend, William Ballard, and asked him if he would run my ranch for me while I was gone. Well, William Ballard also was the manager of the stage line that ran through this area, and, uh, and he had in his house, besides uh, the house, he also had a dining room to feed the passengers, and also a Wells Fargo office for the people. One of the people that, uh, that I met at his place was a fellow named Tom Coe. Tom Coe was one of the famous stagecoach drivers. And Tom, whenever I ran into him, seemed like he always had a story to tell. He told a story about the time, I believe it was in 76, when they had a lot of rain in the springtime, and the Santa Ynez River was running bank to bank, and the stagecoach tried to cross it and got mired down halfway across and turned turtle. But it just happened that a couple of uh, horsemen were riding by at the time, and they were able to go out and, and uh, rescue both the, the stagecoach driver and the two women who were his passengers. Tom was also the first guy who drove the stage over San Pass. Before that, they used to go around through Gaviota. But uh, that's, that's really a story for another time. When I went down to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, went down to Sonora for this couple of years, after I had been there, I had heard that uh, William Ballard had gotten quite ill. In fact, uh, he had to turn the, the operation over to uh, Mr. LaSalle to uh, take care of the property. And then I heard that he was very near death, so I decided I had to wrap things up and, and come up here uh, to the valley again. Once I got up here, I found out that William had in fact died. Well, a discreet period of time later, I ended up marrying William's wife, who he had married basically on his deathbed. So his wife became, I mar married her, her name was Cynthia, and uh, we had a daughter named Mildred. And uh, one of the things I did after, uh, we were, after we were married was that I decided that we needed to get some more people in this area, and so I decided to lay out a town. And I laid out a town in this area, and I decided to name it after my friend, Will Ballard, and that's where the name came from. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the other things uh, was that uh, as we got more people into the valley, we had to have a place for uh, school for them. And 
we ended up, first of all, the school met in my granary. And they outgrew that finally, and then they had to move to another place, which happened to be an old saloon. And when they went in there, it still had the name above, saloon. In 1883, they built a schoolhouse. Some people said it was red, and some people said it was yellow, and I may meet the people who really knew, but I'd like to call it the Little Red Schoolhouse. A lot of... Uh, my wife's family ended up coming to uh, California, but they almost all of them settled up in the San Luis Obispo area. Well, about 1896, I had had about my time on life, and at that time, I came to my final resting place. Go ahead. We come to the grave of Felix Matai. My name is Felix Matty. I bet you recognize the name, and I'm kind of proud of that, because the name is well known in this valley because it's associated with one of the oldest continuously operating eating establishments in the area. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of a lot of things. I'm proud of the fact that I came to America, that I had a family to support me, and I was successful in what I did. And I'm proud of that, too. Now this is based on a lot of things. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I was born in 1853. 1853 was an interesting time. That was the year Van Gogh died. It was also the beginning of the Crimean War. You know the charge of the Light Brigade. That's the time I was born in. I was born in a small town in Seville, which is in Switzerland. It's just across the border from Italy. A lot of people traveled through that place, the Romans, the Phoenicians, everybody came through Italy at some time or the other. And it's a small town, there's nothing there except rock. You either worked with rock, you lived in rock, that's what it was. Fortunately for me, my father was the local town physician, so that was good. My older brother was a sculptor, so good that some of his work's still in Rome and is recognized that. But in 1853, a young boy has to make some choices after he gets his education. About the age of 14, you have to decide what you're going to do with your life. You're either going to work with stone or something else. There's not much else to choose from. And most of the young men went away. Some of them went to Australia. Some of them went to America. I was fortunate because my mother's brother, John Travesi, had already gone to America, probably for the gold rush. I'm not sure. But he was running a successful dairy farm outside of Marin. I am 18 years old. I decide to walk out of the village and down to the boat and catch the boat to New York. Not an easy task, but I did it. I got to New York in 1869, which was the year U.S. Grant was inaugurated as president. Got the train. At that time, you could take a train across the continent of the United States for only $40, which pretty big money at the time. But for $40, you got a wooden bench you could take the train. I took the train. It was only one week after the last spike was set at Promontory, Utah. We made it across the whole United States. We stopped for water. We stopped for wood. We stopped for those buffalo. We stopped for everything. But we finally made it to New York. Then I went down to Mar excuse me, San Francisco. I left New York, went to San Francisco. Finally went down to see my brother, my Uncle John. Gave me a job. I worked there for him a while. Dairy farms, okay. But then I went down and worked for the Steed Brothers, which were at San Luis Obispo. They really had a spread. They had horses and cattle. Now I'm a young man. I'm in my 20s. I'm learning a trade. I'm learning how to, how to drive horses. I'm learning how to train horses. I'm very good at training horses for wagons. That was my specialty. I was so good at that that I made enough to lease my own property, which I did. It's a pretty good spread. I started developing my own horses. I sent for my brother Louis and his, my sister, and they came over to us, and we, we did a nice ranching job. And pretty soon, a man by the name of Bianchi uh, Cayucas, he had a hotel in Cayucas, a good Italian man. I think he asked me to come manage his hotel because I could speak all kinds of languages. At that time in America, a lot of people were coming in. Germans, Italians, Spanish, they were all coming into America. Land was good. So he asked me to run his hotel. 
I could speak all those languages. I could speak Italian, I could speak German, I could speak uh, Spanish, I could do all of these things. So I managed the hotel, and while I was doing that, I met my Lucy. Oh, I met Lucy, nice German girl, great cook. Her father was a gunsmith over in the Central Valley. Very good at that. Lucy was a great cook, I liked that. So she was doing the cooking for us in the hotel, I do the managing. Pretty soon the four boys were born. Uh, they're wonderful boys. The first one was Frank and then Fred. I get them mixed up sometimes. Clarence and Charles. They're all born there in Cayucas. And they would help us in the hotel and they'd help us in the ranch. I think they liked the ranch more than the hotel, but they'd still help us as they were going up. They were going to school there. One day, I kept the ranch, even though I ran the hotel. One day I was taking a string of horses down to Los Angeles. I was in a spring wagon. There's a ranch called Los Olivos Ranch, which was kind of an unsuccessful olive process. And I stopped close to that, and I was talking to some people, and they told me that the Pacific Railroad might be coming into that area. Seemed to me that that would be a good place for a hotel. Why not? So, with what resources I had, keeping the lease that I had in San Luis Obispo, I bought some land in this little area close to the ranch of San Los, Los Olivos. Fortunately for me, I brought enough land in the right place that when the Pacific Railroad did come in, it came in right across the street. And there was a station right there. Good for me. This was actually just about the same time the trains were coming into Santa Barbara and Carpinteria. So the trains were coming on both sides. You couldn't get from Carpinteria and Santa Barbara unless you went over the pass by stage and then you'd catch the train here with us, here in San Luis Obispo, excuse me, San Los Olivos. Fortunately for me, they would stay and then they'd catch the train and go north onto the stage. It was a good thing for us that this happened. The first hotel I built was called the Central Hotel. Not much of a thing, with just some wood around the side and a tent, like a tent over the top of it. Lucy again did the cooking. The boys helped. There in Los Olivos is where my son Albert was born. Albert was something else. He was always Lucy's favorite. But Albert was all my sons. He's the only one that went to college. He went to Stanford. There he studied geology. And from that, Albert went on to become the president of the Honolulu Oil Company. Now that's pretty good. Here I am, a Swiss immigrant. My son, they're all good boys, but Albert was the one who went on to college. Actually, you know, he actually went fishing with the president of the United States, and that was pretty significant. A very big thing in our lives. We're all working together. Frank and Fred were working in the hotel. Oh, let me tell you about Clarence. He's something special, Clarence and Charles. Clarence was the artist. He was really something. He was a portrait painter, outstanding portrait painter. Of course, he spent a lot of time, well, he did come back to the hotel, particularly for family reunions, but he was traveling a lot. He spent a lot of time in New York and Paris, France, places like that. He traveled, but he was very successful at what he was doing. All in all, I think, looking back on it all, we did very well. We started off with virtually nothing as an immigrant, came to America for the support of the family. We all worked together and we built a nice business, which you all are probably very much aware of. Thank you. My name is Grace Lyons Davidson, and I was born February 9th in 1875 in Jefferson, Pennsylvania. My grandparents were Scotch, Irish, and English, and my father, Samuel Lyons, was a coal miner. And my mama, Myra, was a school teacher. Now I can remember mama having to give papa a bath every night to get this coal dust off his body. And, uh, eight, and, I, and I wanted to be a school teacher, so I played school teaching when I was a little girl. And I can remember, I used sticks and stones for my pupils. And one day I was walking along and I saw some toads. And I thought, toads, they'll be perfect pupils. So I picked up a bunch of toads, put them in my apron, and took them to school and laid them down very neatly in rows. And was so pleased with myself. Well, then I started reading the opening prayer like teachers always did. 
and those toads started moving around. So I took my switch, like teachers always did, and switched each one to make them behave and sit still. Well, you know, those toads just puffed up, and they moved away. And I thought, ah, well, that was a good idea, but it didn't work out. So I was back to sticks and stones again for my pupils after that. In 1882, Papa got a letter from his brother-in-law in California telling him what a great place this was to live. So Mama and Papa sold all their belongings, and they could only bring 500 pounds of luggage with them. And Brother and I got on the train with our parents, and we started off. Many trains later, and 3,000 miles later, we got to San Francisco. In San Francisco, we took a boat to Los Angeles. Los Angeles, we took a stern wheeler back to Gaviota. Now, we got off in Gaviota, and it was December, and it was dry and bare, and Papa didn't like it at all. Papa was ready to go right back to Pennsylvania. And Mama said, no, can't. Sold all our things, we have to stay here. That night, we slept on grain sacks, and the next morning, we got on horse and buggy and brought ourselves into Ballard. In Ballard, Papa bought 20 acres, just out of sight of town, and built a house. It was a pretty rough house. I remember it had rough floors that Mama made rag rugs for to put on the floors. And the walls were covered with newspapers instead of wallpaper. Uh, but Mama had her wood stove that she could bake her bread on. And Papa got a mail contract, and he took the mail by horse from Ballard to Buellton to <coughs> San Luis Obispo and back. Even though it was rainy days and rainy year, it was a bad year for him. But Mama made money by making her bread and selling it, and she sold eggs and butter and turkeys and chickens. Now, in 1885, Papa sold that land and bought a house in town with 80 acres. So we moved into town, and this house was wonderful. It had real wallpaper, and it had a wood stove and a wood sink for Mama. And it had water nearby at the bottom of the hill. So the kids and I, we all would, we would all get down there and we'd pump the water from the spring at the bottom of the hill up through a pipe to a big container near Mama's kitchen. So Mama had fresh water all the time. Um, we kids went to school. And in 1883, we were going to school in the saloon, but it was such a bad year. It was a drought year, very dry. The men couldn't do much at their jobs and their, on their farms. So they got together and they built us our one-room Buellton schoolhouse. It was wonderful. It had white plaster walls. It had a roof that didn't leak. It had a blackboard. It had desks and chairs. And we went next door with a bucket to get water from the neighbors so we all could have water to drink. It was a wonderful school. That same year is the year that the Davison family came to town. And Gus Davison, the father, was a blacksmith. And they had a 16-year-old son named Edgar. I thought Edgar was wonderful. I was only 10, so he didn't think much of me, I guess. But, uh-huh. In the... Uh, I graduated from school when I was in the ninth grade, and uh, we had no high school, so I had to go to San Luis Obispo to go to high school. I went to high school for two years, and when I came back, I was 16, and uh, uh, was falling in love with Edgar, because then he noticed me. I was 16 then. When I was 18, I was ready to go to Santa Barbara and get my teacher's credential. So I went down there for a week, came back with my teacher's credential. So now at 18, I had a teacher's credential, and I taught for 10 years school. Edgar and I had to wait to get married because he had to wait until he earned enough money to support a wife. So in 1898, he got a job as a forest ranger up in the mountains at a place called Fur Canyon. Um, and he worked there for four years, and finally in... 1902, he was earning enough money to support a wife. He was earning $75 a month, and that had to pay for his wife and him 
and all the supplies he used in, the, in his job. So 1902, we got married in the church in Ballard that our papas had both helped to build. And then we put our things away and took out our riding clothes and our supplies that we'd gathered and a black cat and went up into the mountains to live in the mountains at Fur Canyon while he did his forest ranger job. That was a wonderful place. I loved that job. I got to ride with Edgar on his rounds in the forest and uh, we slept under a big maple tree. Edgar had built a cabin, but the cabin was infested with wood rats. That's what the cat was for. But it's, it didn't do the job, so we had to sleep outside under the maple tree until the storms came, and then we could go into the cabin. Outside, I had a, wood, I had a stove, and I made our biscuits every day. I had baked beans every day. For, I had uh, mulligan stew. Sometimes I cooked fish. We ha and we had canned tomatoes. So we had plenty to eat up there. Now the first three sons that we had were born while we were living there in the canyon. I came down to Ballard to give birth and stayed four months for each one and then we'd go back up into the mountains. And the boys got along just fine up there too. Well finally it was time for the boys to come to school. So I had to bring them down permanently to Ballard and soon Edgar followed after me. Edgar became the caretaker and the landscaper for this cemetery here. In fact, there's a plaque out there to what he did here. And I raised five children and wrote two books and newspaper articles for the newspapers. So I had a good life here. I loved Ballard, loved living here. I'm buried here in the cemetery. <clears throat> I'm buried next to Edgar, and I have two children that are buried here with me. I see my brothers down there, and uh, it's a beautiful place, and I love being here. And it's just a beautiful day today. Pretty eyes of bonny blue, all my love I give to you. Oh, you look so sweet and fair, picking posies here and there. When I first I saw your heart, I vowed we'd never part. Pretty eyes of bonny blue, all my love I'd give to you. Pretty song, pretty song. Oh, hi. My name's uh, John J. Hopkins. But ever since I was just a little feller, people just called me JJ. I wasn't born in these parts. Actually, I was born just before the Civil War in uh, the land of Lincoln. We didn't stay there very long. My family, Ma and Pa, took us kids, and we moved to Kansas. We left Illinois, and we got in a wagon, and we moved to Kansas, and we started farming there. And some people thought we were dirt farmers, but we didn't like that explanation. We really thought we were just farmers of the, the land, and we did wheat, and we did barley, and we did grains, and we did cereals, that sort of thing. We were pretty successful at it. After being in, in Kansas for a few years, however, we had a couple bad things happen. We had a couple years of drought, which was really bad for the farming. And also, those fellows who were fighting the war not too far started coming into our fields, and they were disrupting our crops. So. Ma and Pa decided it was time for us to move, and Pa had heard about this place called California that I always wanted to go to. So we moved there, and we settled in just up the road, a place called the San Joaquin Valley. And Ma and Pa, we started the farm, and, and really successful. We did that for about six or seven years, and people in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, they got to know Pa. And, and what happened one day was Mom called us all in, and she said, family, there was 12 of us at that point. She says, 
Daddy died today. Well, we were very sad, but also we wondered, what would, what would life have in store for us without Pa? She had a relative, lived in Santa Clara, who was willing to take all 12 of us youngins in. So we moved to Santa Clara. We were so excited because we got to see the Pacific Ocean for the first time. We would lived there for about a year and a half, and something else happened that was very really sad. My mama died. So here we were, 12 orphans, no place to go. We just kind of scattered all about. I wound up in Ballard. It was a lovely family that decided to take me in. And in exchange, I, I did farming, helped them with their farming. But they said I had to do the schooling. So I did the farming and the schooling, and the schooling and the schooling. And it seems like I did a lot more schooling than farming. When I was about 20, I met this young woman. Her name was Alberta. I'd never been in love before, but when I say Alberta, I knew what love was all about. So about a year later, Alberta and I, we up and got married each other. Well, there was a fellow in town by the name of, of George Lewis, and he had some land for sale, and he kind of took a liking to me because he knew I was a hard worker, and Alberta was a sweet young thing. So I bought 200 acres of land for him from him, and they were great because these 200 acres didn't need any irrigation at all. All my other farmer friends, they were having to bring in men to help irrigate. They were having to bring in pipes and horses with water and wagons. And that cost a lot of money. And I didn't have to do any of that because Mr. Lewis, he sold me right on the creek. I just had to build myself what I call a water ladder. So the water would come down the creek. I'd go on the ladder. I'd flood my entire property. Sometimes I'd even sell the water to other people. When I didn't need the water, right, right back down. It was wonderful. It was profitable, as I said, because we didn't have to worry about the irrigation. We worked hard. Except, one day, Alberta died. She died of, well, in those days, we called it consumption. Some of the doctors started calling it tuberculosis. Well, I knew I had to do something. I didn't have a mama, didn't have a daddy. The love of my life died. My brothers and sisters, I didn't know where they were. I thought, thought there might be an opportunity with my farming because I had learned that one of the most difficult things when you do grain is to separate out the, the wheat and the barley and the cereals from the, the brush and the dirty stuff and, 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 the, and the hay. Well, that was called threshing. Well, I'd heard that you could, and that was done by hand, and I'd heard there was something called a thrashing machine. So I'd saved a little bit of money aside, and I went out and I, I found me one. And it was, a, it was a big thing. And I knew that would be a, I could take this from farm to farm. But what I didn't realize is just this machine itself wasn't much good unless I had some other things to go along with it. So I had to get some, some men and had to get some equipment. And I formed the, the JJ... Hobson Thrashing Company. Yeah, some of the folks used to call it Thrashing in those days, but it really was Thrashing. Well, the days would start off, and and I'd, I, it was so very complicated for me that I'd have to, at the beginning of every day, I'd have to come up with a list of all the things I, I had because we couldn't go back and get it later because we had to move on to the farms and, and, and make some money. So I would, I would get out my, 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 my inventory list of things to do. And I put it on a piece of paper, carry it in my pocket. I, this list is so old now, I can't even read it. They got these newfangled things. I supposed to help me. I don't know. I put them on, see what happens. There we go. So here's what I needed. I needed 26 horses for sure. Actually, I needed 27 horses because I needed one extra horse. That extra horse had a saddle on it, and the person who rode that's the man who carried my money. So if we had we really had 27 horses. Had two big water wagons. Each water wagon carried 600 gallons of water. Well, I did the arithmetic one day, and 600 gallons of water, that weighs almost 5,000 pounds, and I had two of these wagons, so I was hauling around 10,000 pounds of water. That's five tons. That's a lot of water. Also, what else I needed was I needed a separator. That would be the thing that would help the thrasher put the good stuff and the bad stuff. I needed a cleaner, because I didn't want to put a bunch of dirt in, dirty, dirty oats and, 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 and wheat in the bag, so that had to be cleaned up first before we could take it to market. 
or give it even back to the farmer. Had a derrick wagon. Uh, derrick wagon was one of those things because just we were getting electricity and they had all these fangled wires that were going across all over the place, connected to the poles. Well, if it worked under one of those things and we hit one of those wires, we'd be in trouble. Someone could even get killed, they could get shocked. Maybe the electricity would go out. Maybe there'd be a fire. So the derrick wagon, that held those up there, big long poles on this wagon until we were through working underneath there. And of course then I needed, I needed men, I needed actually 22 men. Um, and uh, my, my, my foreman was, was Wally. And Wally made $2.27 a day. And he was, he was the sort of, everybody wanted Wally's job. And then of course we had the, the big thrasher machine. That weighed seven tons had a big 200-foot belt, and one of the, most all the other thrasher machines in the area, and there weren't any really as big as mine, but in, the, in California, they all ran on steam. Well, that means they had to carry more water. Sometimes water always wasn't available. So we got smart and we converted our thrasher. It didn't use water, it used hay. So we could just take the hay from the ground, and that was the fuel for our machine. It was great. I said 22 men, didn't I? I lied. We had one extra man, he was probably the most important. His name was Singh. Singh is the man who, little Chinese fellow, about 115 pounds soaking wet maybe, and he was our cook, and he also had the chuck wagon. Singh was, was, he was known all over for his good food, and he would do everything. He'd slaughter the cows, he'd pick the vegetables. He was a wonderful cook, and I paid him a dollar a day plus found. Well found, some people, got, we all called it found, but some people told me, you should call it room and board because that's really what it is. So that was, our, that was our gang. The day would start off, Singh would get up at three in the morning, make breakfast. By four in the morning, the, the, the boys would be rousted up. They'd roll up their, their bed rolls. They'd get dressed, they'd get shaved. They'd go down for breakfast by five o'clock in the morning. We had them in the fields and they would stay in the fields from five o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock at night. It was hard work. Singh would bring out lunches twice a day, a cold lunch to keep a little bit of energy. And at the end of the day, 8 o'clock, the whistle would blow, and all the boys would come in, and they'd have their dinner. They would, they would uh, uh, eat Singh's food, which is a big, big steak, lots of potatoes. Singh would even make fresh pies and biscuits. You would think by this time that the boys would be ready and tired, ready to go to bed. Not J.J.'s crew. They started a wrestling, and they started joking, and... and even once in a while, I must tell you, I, I heard some squealing. It sounded like some girls in the hay, but I can't be sure. And then after, just about we're ready to go to bed, we'd sing. And we'd talk about things that we did right. One time, we were, we were bragging, and we, we set a record one day. You know, one of the things we had to do was we had to move this equipment from one farm to the other to another. Well, some of the other companies, not JJ's, but some of the other companies, it would take them a day, sometimes half a day, sometimes two days. It was a big thing to move all this equipment. Me and the boys, we still have the record. You can look it up. It took us three minutes to go from one farm to the other. We were just laughing and joking about how we'd done this. So at the end of the day, we'd, we'd sing our song. and I was uh, always referred to him as the boys. and to, to them, I was just old Jay. Old Jay didn't get quite as old as Maybe I thought I would. I didn't quite get to see the, the century turn its years. But I know that I could, at the end of every day, I'd sit down on my rock and contemplate and be really happy and proud about how I was helping make things better for the people who lived up here. So as I get ready to go to sleep, I'd lay my head down. I'd think about the day and as I went to sleep, I would just close my eyes and say, Pretty eyes of bonny blue, all my love I give to you. Pretty eyes of bonny blue. Hello, I'm Bird Sides. I am sitting here in front of my parents' grave, the blood goods, and on the other side, the sides, the, pair, the uh, family I married into. This 
fam both of these families came from Kearney, Debra Nebraska. They were in such good luck when they decided to migrate out here. There was a train war going on, and you could go across the United States from one end to the other for a dollar. And so the first to come out was the sides, and they came out by the way of San Francisco. When they got to San Francisco, they uh, took the steamboat, which the train company owned, down to Avila and over to um, San Luis Obispo, where they took the 60-mile the train trip up to Las Olivas. When John Sides got here, he bought a 100-acre farm right outside of Las Olivas. He and his son built a farmhouse there. And after they had finished building the farmhouse, they helped come into, they went into town and with relatives and friends uh, built the first church in Las Olivas. Now this church was rather, you know, conservative. It had two entrances, one for the men and one for the ladies. And the men, when they went in, would sit on one side of the church and the ladies would sit on the other side of the church. Um, it was finished in um, eight, 1894, and that same year, um, John's wife, Amanda, um, died in that church. Uh, they were just starting a meeting, and um, she got up from her bench and went across to her brother, Will, and said, Sh uh, shall we begin the meeting with a prayer, and slowly walked back to her seat, sat down, and passed away. It was at this time that John purchased this uh, graveyard plot. And it begins here, and it goes almost all the way down to that road down there. It has enough uh, area in it for a hundred people. He must have been expecting a crowd. Uh, my, I think that my future husband must have been a mama's boy because he waited until his mother had passed away before he asked my father for my hand. And uh, he wired my father if he could marry me. And my father was absolutely elated. He had had seven girls and six of them had married and I was the last one, and he was able to marry me off. We took, the, uh, he and my mother and myself, took the southern route of the uh, train uh, that went past um, Santa Fe and down to Los Angeles, and then we took the, a, a stagecoach up from L.A. to Santa Barbara in a stagecoach over the pass to Lost Lee. Always remember the day I was. Can't you? Oh my goodness. We walked down the main route uh, that went through Las Olivas. On one side was the roundhouse and the depot, and on the other side, Maddie's Tavern. We got on the train, the dollar fifty for a round trip ticket, and we went to. Uh, to San Luis Obispo, and we were married in the San Luis Obispo courthouse. Afterwards, we all went and had our picture taken, uh, and on the and and we were able to catch the train on the way home. And we got home, and we uh, just in time to make dinner, and uh, do all the chores. We immediately started our family, and. Um, but at the same time, my, both of my parents died. And this is in 1880, uh, 1898. This is when this particular stone was erected um, for, my, for the blood goods. Pardon me a second. Remember what I was going to say. Uh, 
in 1901, in 1901, John Sides and my my husband built a one room, um, one room um, building for their hardware store. In 1912, uh, this stone was erected for John because that was the year he died. And in 1917, my husband tore down the old building and built the, the two-story building, which is still there today. Um, the bottom part was for his uh, hardware store, and the top was a long floor that uh, at the beginning, every uh, Saturday night, they would have a dance, and all the people and farm people would come in uh, from out of door, out of town, to the dance upstairs, and uh, the whole family would dance, even the kids. And when the kids got tired, they um, rolled them underneath the, the benches, and the the uh, parents would continue to dance. Well, that building dance too. It went back and forth and back and forth and it really scared some of the ladies. Now uh, Melbourne didn't turn out to be the ideal father. He was really uh, very strict and cranky and kind of uptight as well as the fact that he didn't believe in uh, that women should have an education and he refused to have his daughters go on to high school. He died in 1923 of total cancer and his the um, hardware store went to his one and only son Carl. Well now if you lived in the valley you knew uh, stories about Carl because everybody knew uh, something that funny that happened that Carl happened to Carl. Well my the, the thing that I liked my story about him was that he was robbed several times and one time the robbers came in and they demanded that he open up the safe. Well he got so nervous he couldn't open up that safe and finally the robbers gave up in disgust and took Carl out in the car with him to and drove five miles out of town let Carl out and poor Carl had to walk five miles back into town and the robbers got away with nothing. I was a typical um, pioneer woman. I ran the, f the farm. I did all the chores on the farm and during my lifetime I had several accidents. One of them was that I was up on the ladder cleaning out the pipes from the wood stove and I fell and I had to crawl a hundred yards out to the to the uh, road and I had to crawl through the house and through the grape arbor finally got there and a woman picked me up took me into a doctor and I had broken my leg it took a long time for this farmhouse to become modernized uh, mostly because of the depression we couldn't afford to put in, in any of these modern things but finally we did get it up to snuff uh, but fine the the last thing to go was the outhouse and uh, the funniest thing that happened to the outhouse was one day my my uh, great-grandson Donnie who was two or three went out to the outhouse with a flashlight and he looked down the hole and he was so startled he dropped the flashlight into the hole and that outhouse was lit up for two weeks. <laughs> if I had a, to tell, a, uh, if I had a lesson in my life, perhaps it would be to tell you ladies not to marry a man twice your age. My, uh, Melbourne was twice my age when I married him and I was married to him for 27 years but on the other hand, I was a widow for 27 years. And this is a long time to be by yourself and a widow. I uh, died in 1951 on a fishing trip with one of my daughters in Mono Lake. And I had a stroke and I was uh, 74 
years old. I am Alice DeForest Sedgwick, Duke's widow. Duke was a family nickname. His given name was Francis Mintern Sedgwick. Lying next to me here is our daughter, Mrs. Edith Sedgwick Post. In the 1960s, Edie was an associate of that so-called artist, Andy Warhol, and appeared in a couple of his amateur movies. She modeled for Vogue magazine and according to our son, was the inspiration for Bob Dylan's song, Just Like a Woman. Like so many people during those tumultuous times, she started using drugs and found she couldn't stop. And so she came here for treatment. While she was hospitalized, she met Michael Post. They were married in 1971 and sadly, four months later, she was found dead of a drug overdose in their apartment in Santa Barbara. Edie had always been a troubled child. She developed an eating disorder during her adolescence and was in and out of treatment facilities ever since. Fortunately, Frances was spared this loss, having died two years previously. There is a mistaken notion that being born into a family of wealth and privilege is a guarantee of a happy and carefree life. Instead of living a fairy tale, my life at times resembled more of a soap opera. As a parent, one does not expect to outlive one's children. But before Edie died, we had lost two of our sons. Our second son was named after his father, but we called him Minty. He was a very sensitive person who did not care for life on our ranch. He was a terrible disappointment to us because having attended Groton, he was not accepted at Harvard and went to Berkeley instead. He suffered terribly from depression and was hospitalized several times and during his last stay in 1964 he was found dead in his room having hanged himself. Our eldest son, Robert, had a fine artistic talent after his sophomore year at Harvard, he was in and out of treatment facilities too. In fact, he was in the same place as Minty when Minty died. Somehow, after that terrible episode, Bobby was able to pull himself together and did some graduate work. Then, on New Year's Eve, he drove his Harley Davidson motorcycle into a bus in New York City and died in January of 1965. Their father scattered both of their ashes on our ranch property. I met Francis through my older brother, Charles. They were both classmates at Groton. Our family was visiting England while Duke was working for a bank in London, having just graduated from Harvard in 1926. At the time, I was considered somewhat of a beauty, although in my middle 20s, I developed a middle ear infection that required surgery, and it damaged the facial nerves of my face, and I have been unable to smile normally ever since. I know there were some people who thought that Duke was only interested in me because of, I came from a wealthy family. It is true, though, that the Sedgwicks were a fine and distinguished family, with an impressive colonial heritage. But the DeForests were more successful financially. After we fell in love, Duke sailed back to the United States. He was then institutionalized at a facility in Massachusetts for a second time, where he was diagnosed with manic depressive psychosis. This condition is characterized by dramatic mood swings, extreme behaviors, self-centeredness, and grandiosity. His doctor, Dr. Millett, strongly advised us not to have children because he believed that this condition was hereditary 
And there were problems, emotional problems, along the Sedgwick ancestral line. Well, perhaps because of this condition or in spite of it, we had eight children in a period of 14 years following our marriage in 1929. After our marriage, we moved to California having purchased a lemon grove in Goleta. Duke always saw himself first as a rancher, but he had a very strong interest in the fine arts. As a student, collector, philanthropist, and as a very sculptor. Some of his work is on display in Santa Barbara. The equestrian statue at the Earl Warren Showground, the St. Barbara at the Historical Society, and of course the St. Francis at the Mission. He also wrote two novels, and they were published, but they were not very well received. I came to this marriage as the daughter of Henry Wheeler de Forest, a very successful lawyer from New York City who worked for many clients, among them the Southern Pacific Railroad, where he eventually became chairman of the board. Our family traveled to California in his private railroad car when I was a child. His income provided us with two homes, one in the city and another a lovely estate on Long Island called Nethermere, where I learned to ride horses. After my father died, Nethermere was donated for scientific research and renamed Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in 1942. The de Forest originally were French Huguenots who, having fled France for Holland, came with a company that established New Amsterdam. My mother was Julia Gilman Noyes, and she had an interesting family tree too. It included that famous historical figure, Anne Hutchinson, and a colonel from the American Revolution, Joseph Noyes from Rhode Island. I was educated at Miss Nightingale's school in New York City, and I attended the Juilliard School of Music where I studied the piano. This, of course, led to my affiliation later with the Music Academy of the West. Our youngest daughter, Susanna, plays the piano wonderfully well. We also have three other daughters, Alice, Pamela, and Kate, and nine grandchildren. After father died, we purchased the Rancho Corral de Quati in the San Inez Valley, where we raised cattle and later found oil. Then, in 1952, we purchased the Rancho La Laguna de San Francisco, a property consisting of about 6,000 acres. It was our intention, perhaps inspired by my parents' act of generosity, to donate this land to the University of California. However, Duke and I had a major disagreement about how this was to be done. He wanted the entire property donated, whereas I thought our children ought to share in some of this inheritance. It's taken a while to work out the details, and they still haven't been finalized at the time of my passing. As a child, Duke lived in Santa Barbara with his parents, Henry Dwight Sedgwick and Sarah May Mintern. His mother died when he was just 15 and his father remained single up until his early 90s. And then he married this woman who was 40 years younger than he was. Well, my husband did not care for her, nor did he approve of this marriage, and he went so far as to write her a letter telling her to stay out of California. Being married to Duke certainly had its challenges, and I was not blind to his attraction to the other women. In fact, it was a woman from here who convinced him to become a Roman Catholic. So his funeral was held at the mission in Santa Barbara, and at his request, his ashes were scattered by our son Jonathan on our beloved property, the Rancho La Laguna de San Francisco. So here I am with Edie. Let's wake her up and all say, call Clara. Clara! 
Clara. Oh, 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 no, I'm not Clara. I am Caroline Stubbs. Clara is my twin sister. She and I sleep together underneath this stone. And we have ever since they moved us here from the Buell Ranch Family Cemetery. You know, I've been told since then that the reason they moved us is because they paved over our first resting place. I can't imagine that. They paved it over. You know why? To make more parking for that Anderson's Electrical Cafe. <laughs> I can't. Oh, oh. Oh, but you know what? That place did make the very best pea soup. <laughs> you know, though, Clara, Clarissa, as I always called my twin and I, were born the fifth and sixth children of 11 of Mary Margaret and William Stubbs in the tiny little village of Worthing, Sussex County, England. We were born in 1833. That makes me 93 years old. Our third younger sister is here also. She's over there in that last standing, the, the fourth, fifth one down there. Her name is Ellen. Ellen is actually the reason why Clarissa and I are here. And the reason is because Ellen married Jimmy Stubbs, a uh, Jimmy Bud, and in 1868, after they had their little girl, Emily, they emigrated to Pennsylvania. Uh, 24 years later, when Emily, my niece Emily, was 24, a 65-year-old man, rancher from California by the name of Rufus T. Buell, came to Titusville, Pennsylvania, and he married my niece. They came back to the ranch, and they had five children. And that's what brought Clarissa and I to the ranch. We helped take care for those little children. There was Rufus Jr. and uh, Glenn and Walter and Odin and darling little Gertrude, and Gertrude's right here. Anyhow, uh, they, you know, all of those children, many of those children, and some of their, their children, too, are all around here. They're all buried here. But, you know, I didn't want to tell you about them. I wanted to really tell you about that rascal Rufus, or R.T., as we called him. R.T. was born in 1827 in Vermont. That, make, that means he was born six years before I was. Anyhow, in 1853, he got on board the Yankee Blade, and he came all the way around the Horn and up to San Francisco, where he became a jack of all trades. He did a little bit of gold mining, and he did a little, he read a little bit of law, and he even edited a San Francisco newspaper, and he also married number one wife of three, Caroline. Caroline and R.T. moved to Point Reyes, where R.T. started as a farmhand, and then he ended up with his own dairy farm. He also, while he was there, divorced Caroline. Now, you have to know that with a name like Caroline, she couldn't have been the one at fault. Mm, mm. Anyhow, by 1865, R.T. had come south and was in Salinas, and he also had a dairy farm there. He also, besides the dairy farm, had a meat market. He was making his way up in the world. Well, then he came to Santa Barbara County, and he became a really big rancher. The San Carlos de Hanata Rancho, which had been an original Spanish land grant in 1845 when it was granted by then Mex uh, Mexican Governor Pio Pico to the Covarrubias and the Carrillo families of Santa Barbara, was just under 27,000 acres when R.T. bought into it in 1867. That ranch stre stretched from the San Inez River in the south to Zaca Station in the north, from the San Inez Mission right down here, 
all the way miles past Buellton, a big rancho. Once he had the ranch, he went back to Vermont on the train to his own hometown, and he married wife number two, his cousin Helen Goodchild, and he brought her back to the ranch. They also had five children, but only one of them, Linus, who's buried across the little lane there, survived childhood. You know, two of their little boys are also across that little lane. If you look over there, you'll see a pretty little double white marker, and that double white marker is where the two little bo Buell boys are. I never knew why what happened or why little Arthur Buell died at 11 years of age in 1887. But his grave marker says that he was slain by the hand of criminal might. But when Clarissa and I got to the ranch, no one was talking about that, not even R.T. Oh, I know. I need to tell you, too, about the, the huge drought that Santa Barbara County had in 1877. By 1890, things were so bad up around the ranches that R.T. had to give back 1,200 acres of the ranch to the bank that held the mortgage. And included in that was the beautiful bottomlands back here that were called the Buell Flats. Well, several years after that, three Danish Americans bought that property. And in 1911, that pretty little village over there called Solvang was created on the southeast corner of the Buell Ranch, the San Carlos de Hanato Rancho. On the western side of the ranch, way over there, was where the family lived. It was the family homestead. And that's where we live. You know, it was like a little town all of its own. We had our own blacksmith. We had our own grocery store. We had a dairy hall, a house. We even had our own cheese factory. And we also had our own postmaster. The postmaster was William Budd, Emily's brother. And he's buried here too. You know, you're surrounded by Buds and stubs and buells. Anyhow, um, hmm, where was I now? Uh, oh yes, William Budd. William Budd, the postmaster, wanted to honor that rascal R.T. who died in aught eight, in aught five, and his stone is this tall one right here. And he wanted to get the town the ranch town made into an official town, and so he petitioned the government to make the town a real town. And in 1920, in 1920, in 1920, it what became Buellton. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, when I when I talk about 1920, it's I'm, I'm sorry. It was such a terrible time for me, just an awful year, because on the 14th of July in that year, my beautiful, darling twin, Clarissa, perished in a fire at the main ranch house that burned the ranch house down. There are different stories about what happened, but Clara has told me since that she was going to bed. She was 87 years old at that time. She was going to bed and climbing the stairs, holding her little candle to, for her light. And she stumbled on the stairs and fell. And that was all it took. No one could get to her in time. And she was gone. I think I hear her calling. Do you? Can you? Yeah. Oh, she says it's really late. That must be why my eyes are closing. Why I'm so tired. I'm sorry. I've got to go. You have been watching the reenactment of 
history in the Oak Hill Cemetery in Ballard. I hope you enjoyed visiting this beautiful place and learning a little bit more about this community and how it got started. And we welcome you to visit us again in two years when we'll be down in Santa Barbara. So this is put on by? And this has been put on by the Santa Barbara County Genealogical Society and the Santa Inez Valley Museum. Thank you.